A seamless space to ground transition is the crowning achievement of space simulation games, but only a few have actually pulled it off. You've got No Man's Sky, Star Citizen, My Game, and once you've watched this video, your game too. In the last video, we figured out how to generate a planet with a procedural texture. But if we fly close to that planet, all we get is a super low resolution texture. So we need to generate some terrain when we get close to the planet. Now we could offset the vertices of the planet model to create that terrain, but I've created this beautiful ship model for scaling purposes, and our planet is clearly nowhere near the resolution we need. But if we increase the number of vertices per side, our computer starts to melt down. Now, fortunately for us, our planet is secretly a cube, something like this. So all we need to do is take each of these sides and divide them up into chunks. Let's say we want 128 chunks per side. And each chunk will have some resolution. Let's say they have 32 vertices per side. That will give us 128 times 32 vertices for each of these sides, which will give us 16,744,464 vertices for each face. This is an insanely big number, but remember we don't have to draw all of the chunks at once. Instead, we'll get the player's position and we'll draw the chunks that are within a certain distance. Now, we'll need two different classes here, a chunk manager class and a chunk class. There will be one chunk manager for each planet that will check which chunks need to be generated and create chunk objects for each of those places. And the chunk class will use a lot of the same code as the faces of our planet from the last video. But we can actually go a step further and create some different levels of detail. In the area very, very close to the player, we could create some high resolution chunks, which here I'll just do four by four. And in the area around that, we could create some slightly lower resolution chunks. And in the final area around that, we could create chunks that are just one by one. So we have a very, very high resolution close to the player and lower and lower resolution further out, but it's still a good amount of terrain overall for the player to look at. To implement this, let's make a new data type called fchunklod that will store a float view distance. So that's how far out this chunk is allowed to generate and int for the resolution of this type of chunk and a boolean for whether this lot has collision, because we only want to do that in the most central area where the player will actually be. Now we can create an array of those objects to easily edit in Unreal's details panel. And to actually use those, we can add a function to our chunk object. First, we'll calculate the distance to the player, then we'll loop over the lods from the smallest to the largest, and the smallest lod this is a part of will return that lod or we'll return an empty lot if this isn't inside any of the lots. And now we have different levels of detail, high quality close to the player and low quality farther away. But even if we turn our planet back into a sphere, we still don't have any noise to actually change the height of the terrain. So I found this awesome library called Fast Noise, which works in Unreal Engine and can generate Perlin noise, simplex noise, cellular noise, a whole bunch of different noise types. So hopefully we can use that to generate some pretty varied types of terrain. To use the library, all we have to do is set all of the parameters. For this, I created a data type called fNoiseParams, which includes the number of octaves, the lacunarity, the gain, all the stuff you need for a multi-layer noise setup. And when it comes time to generate the noise, all we have to do is call the getNoise function and pass in our x, y, and z coordinates. And now we can fly from a space down to our planet and we'll actually have terrain to greet us. But it looks terrible and it still doesn't perform well enough. The problem here is not the number of vertices we're having to render, but it's actually the distance checks we're doing against almost 100,000 chunks every single frame to determine which chunks need to be rendered and which chunks shouldn't be. So to limit the number of checks we have to do, we're going to use a system called quad trace, and it works like this. Say we have a single face of the cube, and it's supposed to be eight chunks by eight chunks. Instead of checking all 64 positions, which is what we were doing before, we start by creating one quad tree to cover the face, and we tell it, you have to deal with eight chunks per side. So this quad tree, We'll then go ahead and create four quad trees underneath it and it will tell each of them you have to deal with four chunks per side now each of these quad trees will go ahead and create four quad trees under itself and it will tell each of them you have to create two chunks per side and that's the lowest level of quad tree now the important part comes in when we actually want to check what chunks are in range 
instead of going through all 64 chunks, let's say the player is right here. First, we'll define the view distance. Let's say it's right about here. So then we have a circle like this, and anything inside the circle should be rendered. Anything outside should not. You're probably catching on at this point, but instead of actually checking all of the 64 chunks, we start by checking the highest quad tree, which is the red quad tree. The red quad tree is in range, so we have to assess the quad trees under it. And we can immediately see this one is out of range. This one is out of range and this one is out of range. So instead of checking the 4x4, four four, the 16 chunks in each of these, we've skipped them with a single check. Now this yellow area is obviously in range, so then we loop over the green quad trees under it, and we find that all four of them are in range. So then we loop over the chunks under them, and we find that all of these chunks are in range. And this is just a small example with eight chunks per side, but since we have 128 chunks, we're saving even more performance than just this. If you're interested, here's the quad tree data structure, here's the code for generating the quad trees, and here's the code for checking which ones need to be updated with the player's position. I also added a quick check on the player's position, so we only try to update the chunks if the player has moved more than one chunk width since the last time we updated the chunks. Now our performance is way better and it's time to actually make the chunks look good. First thing I'd like to do is fix the terrain's normals. Now every vertex on a mesh has a normal, a 3D vector that says basically where that vertex is facing. This is how Unreal calculates shadows for lighting, but we're also going to use it for some other things that will make our terrain look much better. Now, when we just had a sphere, and I'll do it with a circle here just to make things a little simpler, all we had to do was take the vector from the center of the sphere to our vertex, and that could be our normal, because that way all of the vertices would be facing 100% away from the center of the sphere, which is obviously what we wanted. But if we're using noise to change the height of the sphere at different positions, well, at a position uh, somewhat like this, where it's flat, we're going to want to do the same exact thing. But at a position like this, where it's angled, we need the normal to be sort of perpendicular to those vertices. So we can't just take this vector from the center of the sphere to our given vertex. We need to know if the terrain is tilting up or tilting down so we can calculate that vector. And the only way to know the slope of the noise is to use the noise function to figure that out. So when we're adding a vertex, instead of just sampling the noise once, we're going to sample it once at the vertex, once a little bit to the right, and once a little bit up. And keep in mind that these directions are relative to the face that we're on. But think about it. If the terrain is sloping up a lot in the up-down axis, well then this value is going to be much greater than the original value, because we're increasing in that direction. And if the terrain is sloping down a lot on the right-left axis, well then the rightward value is going to be a lot less than the initial value. So we can use these values to determine the slope on both axes. And to turn these two values into one vector, we'll calculate the position where both noise samples would be, and then we'll calculate a vector from our vertex to each of those. And then we'll take the cross product of that. Now, the first time I took this cross product, I did the bitangent first and the tangent second, and the vectors were basically upside down, so the lighting looked like it was coming from underneath. If that happens to you, just switch the order of these two, and it'll work correctly. Now our lighting calculations are looking much better, but that's not the only thing we can use this normal for. Remember, the normal is basically telling us the angle of the vertex, so we can take the difference between the angle from the center to this vertex and the normal, and we can get how much of a slope this position is at. So if the normal is straight up and the vertex is straight up, this is flat. But if the normal and the vertex are at a dramatic angle, then this must be a very steep slope. And in Unreal's shader graph, this is actually pretty easy to do. We can take the absolute world position of our vertex and we can subtract the position of the planet, which is a variable that we can input from the script. And we normalize this to get that vector from the center to the vertex. Then we also take the normal and we normalize it just to be safe, and we take the angle between those two vectors. And if we just plug this 0 to 1 value into our shader, you can see the flat parts are black and the sloped parts are white. Now we can use that to blend between two different materials. So let's say stone for slopes and grass for flatter areas, and we get something like this. Or if we want it to be a bit more alien, something like this.
Now I did a bit more than just blend between two colored textures because we have to map the textures onto the sphere and the sphere's UVs aren't correct because the different faces are angled in different directions and the different directions cause UV issues so the different faces wouldn't line up and there would be various problems with that. Look, I'll link to a better video on triplanar mapping in the description if you want to check that out, but this is the finished material. And the last thing we need to make our planets look absolutely top-notch is an atmosphere. An atmosphere that works from space and continues to work on the ground. And I found a brilliant shader for this on GitHub, which I've linked to in the description, which is super easy to change the color of and various other parameters. So let's grab our spaceship and visit some randomized worlds.